Charles Forbes was a local lawyer who briefly served as a state supreme judge uh, who lived a very uh, modest life and ended up saving money that he decided to leave to the library. And uh, it was a very generous act that was um, replicated in many of the institutions that we think of uh, that define Northampton. So we have a, a public theater, the Academy of Music um, for uh, Lilly Library, the library up in Florence, Smith College. So many of these institutions, Look Park, if you look back, were founded this way. Um, and it, it's really amazing how much phil philanthropic um, impact they had on what we think of as Northampton today. He, his, his will, he was an interesting person, a complicated person, uh, but he wanted people to have that access. He wanted people to be able to learn and grow if they were interested in learning and growing. Um, and um, he, he, his vision, there was another public library act in Northampton at the time, oh. uh, but he wanted to start his own library. So it, it was, it's, it's an interesting story and we're very grateful to him that he did. I'm Elise Bernier Feely, a local history and genealogy librarian at Forbes Library. Just before Charles Edward Forbes' death, he was thinking of his library and the materials, I think, of what he wanted it built of. When First Church of Christ Congregational was burned to the ground, the old church, it was called, um, he occupied a suite of rooms uh, at the old bank, which was on the corner of Center Street in Maine, and he saw the entire uh, building go down to conflagration, and I'm sure he was thinking, that will not happen to my library. He wrote that he wanted his library to be fireproof. Now, after his death in 1881, that was a tall order for the trustees because they had to find someone who could do that. And it was kind of providential that a man named Rafael Guastavino and his son had come to the United States from Portugal, and he had evolved a vaulting system for buildings that was very, very strong. And we call these today the Guastavino arches, and they are constructed in a very interesting way and with not so much brick, but tile. And it's very, very strong. It dried quickly. All of those aspects were wonderful. And it was fireproof.
the presidential library, it's very unusual that we have a presidential library inside of the public library. Uh, and it's an interesting story how that came to be. Uh, so um, Harrison um, was one of the early directors and he was a big collector. He um, collected all kinds of things. So we have this fabulous World War uh, World Wars posters, I should say, um, and, 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 and that's a very beautiful collection. Um, it's also of historical interest, and uh, he really saw one of the roles of, of being the library director was to create these collections that were um, just going to be before us for a short period of time, and, and then what could they bring to the community as, as a research tool into the future. So he uh, started following Calvin Coolidge's political campaign when he was I believe it was when he was governor. It could have even started before that when he was mayor because he really came up through the ranks and um, reached out to the campaign and, and asked for materials, which he started to archive and file. And a relationship had been developed. Uh, Calvin Coolidge and his wife were cardholders at the library, very proud to have that affiliation. And so when Coolidge left the White House, he had options and he decided to bring his papers and um, his library of books right here to Forbes. It came right from the White House. And um, shortly thereafter, in the mid 50s, um, the room after he had passed was, was dedicated and it's been up there ever since. Um, having it here is a, is an honor. It's also an obligation. It's it's he was the last president that didn't come with federal funding for his library, which is the current practice. Um, and we the, the the access and preservation are uh, components of library service that are equally as challenging and resource intensive and, and yet we're trying to run a public library and do this at the same time and so um, we've certainly kept everything safe. I think the next phase is to really think about that access and part of that is to set his record and the history around him and his family in the context of both a local story um, as well as um, raising the um, complexity of the issues. So not just glorifying um, him as the perfect president or make the perfect decision maker, but sort of showing how his decisions came about, um, what they were based out of, uh, what was the history before them and what was the impact after as a tool to learn from. So I, th I'm hopeful that we can get to that point. Um, that was work that got a little waylaid because of the pandemic, but we're committed to seeing go, go forward. And, and Stan, as you know, you're one of the one one of the pieces of that is a documentary about Coolidge that focuses on his Massachusetts years because there the he, he was born in Vermont and there is a film that focuses on his Vermont years but the, this Massachusetts film would be a wonderful asset um, for us to use as an educational tool for people coming to visit us or thinking about visiting visiting us so I look forward to when that can be So we have been doing programming um, since way back when. Actually, on our 125th anniversary, one of the things that we did was a community sing out on the lawn, which um, replicated, I guess, to some extent, an event that had taken place at the end of World War I. So it was the 100th anniversary of this event. Singing along, it was mostly patriotic songs at that time, but uh, it was a way to bring the community together and to celebrate the end of the war. Um, and so we have done some outdoor concerts. These community sings have inspired our arts and music librarian through the years um, to replicate outdoor programming, specifically concerts and sing-alongs. And so those are continuing.
get into this. Well, this is your stuff. You, were, you show the Swiss gallery, don't you? Yes, yeah. yeah, he told me, yeah. 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 Tricks, but just different. Yeah. People are actually reading it. Oh, it's Yeah. Oh, this is not something I expected. Yes. Is that right? <laughs> Everything is done in a document. That must be a very meditative, sort very, of yeah, quiet process. process. Yeah. Do you listen to music or anything? I listen to jazz. And all these were just like cut paper with different metallic, silver, blue, red, and all that would give me the tones of a so, black and white. But we didn't have, and, we, and children's programming has been something we've done for, for a long time, especially in the summer as a tie into summer reading program. Uh, we've, we've emphasized that literacy, early literacy is built not, upon, not just upon reading and writing, but also singing and playing. Uh, and so engaging those other skills help actually to strengthen reading skills. So it's been something that we've done um, and, and continue to do. programming has been relatively recent in terms of it's how robust it's been and um, concerted the efforts have been. And that really started about 20 years ago with the writer in residence program. The previous director was friends with a local writer and she approached us, Diana Gordon, who should be named, she, she really was a catalyst of change here at the library and, and, re, and said, you know, there's not much going on for adults and we have such a rich literary community, uh, both writers and readers, that I'd like to see us do something. And so the two of them dreamed up a, a, a series, it was actually a poetry discussion and reading series, it was a couple different things that went on for years and years. And, and I, that's when I had stepped in as assistant director and was part of that. And we just each month would bring local authors, mostly a lot of local poets in to read their work. Um, and that sort of spurred us into thinking about people saw us as a place to come and showcase their work or the things that they were interested in and us to connect with the community and larger communities that maybe we hadn't been connecting with. And so it really just took off from there. So there's the things you would really think of maybe as uh, book discussions, um, all kinds of literary based events, but then it went on to, to programming and concerts and there's yoga and uh, you name it. And, and what's really been great about the programming is that it highlights the interests of the community. So very rarely do we do something in a vacuum. It's often because we're approached by somebody else in the community and we always try to say yes. So if it's a conservation group or social justice organization or whatever it is, we really want to provide a platform for the community to connect with others and, and, and discuss what they're, what they're interested in. Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'm Susan Stinson, I'm the writer in residence at Forbes Library, which is a fabulous 
lucky thing to get to do. And this is the Local History, Local Novelist series. And the series is based on the premise that the depth and nuance and empathy with which we engage with history is in large part defined by the depth and nuance and empathy with which we engage with story, stories of all kinds. So I want to honor all those who stop time by writing about the lost towns of the Swift River Valley and to welcome our readers. Hiker, for solitude, walk here. If you are patient, you will be rewarded by fox, turkey, coyote, deer. Grouse may startle up from brush, raccoon or porcupine peer down from a limb. Near water, follow osprey scanning for fish, eagles riding the thermals, loons reappearing after long dives. Trails lead past lush beds of fern, flickering in every shade of green. To dams knit by beavers, exquisite in their knowledge of where a meadow is needed. You may never see another human all day. If you listen to wind comb the forest, trees creaking like floorboards, you may suddenly be gripped by old sorrows and not know why. The footage we're gonna show you tonight, donated by his family, is of the flood of 1936. It is, as far as we know, the only film footage of Northampton in the flood of 1936 and has never been before seen publicly. This is a song that my parents taught me, and I hope I can remember all the words. So you're gonna go for it. Why did I kiss that girl? Why, oh, why, oh, why? Why did I kiss that girl? I could almost cry. I'm nervous, so nervous. I'm worried and blue. And if her kiss did that, what would her hug and do? Ma says that I'm a wreck. I admit she's right. Pa says he'll break my neck. He can't sleep at night. They're upset and all because I ain't like I used to was. Why did I kiss that girl? Why, oh, why, oh.
Hi, um, I'm looking for a hold that says it was checked in Um, 2017. She may have an upcoming title. Um, there is a film about Marilyn Monroe that is in pre-production right now. Um, that said, they are just doing the casting, so I don't know if it is definite that she is. I guess the big thing is, um, the big things that we've been working on, you know, I, I'll call them opportunities what, what, more so than, than challenges, because I really feel like we're in a really good place um, in terms of the building. I'll start to start with the physical structure, which is so tied to our identity. We just had our 125th anniversary, and the building is in the best shape it's been in decades, literally, because we just had the windows refurbished. Um, the the stonework had been repointed, the roof has been maintained, everything is just, the building is really looking great, and it wasn't that way. Um, there had been deferred maintenance for years, and um, so the trustees really should be credited along with the city of Northampton for bringing this building back, so that's really great. This is an ex extraordinary story of William C. Brocklesby, who was the architect of this building. First of all, I'd like you to see the archway. The archway that H.H. That H. H. Richardson did was an archway that was reminiscent of what they call the Syrian arch. The Syrian arch is much shorter than a regular arch and sits on capitals. That arch is, is much shorter and, and I, I'll use the word squattier <laughs> than a regular arch. And that is a Richardsonian trait. All of his entryways are like this. You can also see at this vantage point that we have a slate roof. This is completely a slate roof 
which is on top of, by the way, a steel structured building. Because Mr. Forbes wanted a building that was fireproof, not only did uh, Mr. Gaylord and, and the rest of the trustees want uh, Guastavino arches, which were impregnable to fire, they also wanted something that would be fireproof in terms of the skeleton of the building. We have pictures of that skeleton, if you will, going up. The American Bridge Company did it, along with the Berlin Iron Bridge Company. Recently, our country has been, uh, again, addressing, um, waking up to the racial injustice and, and systemic racism in our country. And I think the library, um, that is something that we are not immune to. Um, I, both from the publishing world, um, how libraries are set up and who, the, who, who people feel like they are there for. So we are um, creating, um, we've created a committee to look at this and really dig into it. And we've done this work. I mean, I, we have, we, you know, I'm proud to say that this has been on our minds and we've made some great strides, but this has really focused us in, in a new way. So again, um, something to be concerned about, but that we are trying to take energy from and create an opportunity out of. Right now, it's definitely the, the COVID-19 pandemic situation. Uh, when we had to close our doors in mid-March, it was a very difficult decision for us and for everyone. Uh, libraries really pride themselves in access, and we've been working so hard to increase access. It happened right after, after the city's override passed. There was a vote in our community to um, the taxpayers elected to increase their taxes to support city services. And this meant that the library was in really good standing. Um, and we had increased our hours last year. Our circulation was hitting an all time high. Uh, our programming is just really, was really robust. And the, you know, the, the library was just bustling. And all of a sudden we just had to shut the door and um, closing off that access was just devastating. Um, the uncertainty of when things are going to happen and when we can safely move into the next phase and, and you know, keeping people safe, I guess, is on the forefront of my mind. We're doing everything we can to follow the state safety protocol. So masks, I took mine off briefly here in the office, but in general, we're fully masked, social distancing, minimal staff on site, um, all of those things, and really just focusing the work that we do on site to things that we can't do from home. What do we have here? We have a library that shows the depth of what it does, which is to educate people for free. And isn't that wonderful?